Okay, let's get started. I've got a countdown timer here, so I want to be on time. Um, welcome to day three of the Open Infra Summit. Uh, I'm Toby Owen. I lead uh, product development, product management for Fungible. And uh, we're going to talk today about a little more in depth about data processing units and composable infrastructure. And um, we'll try to leave some time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, it's a little hard to see people, so, um, but there are mics on both sides if you've got questions um, when, when we're done with the presentation. Um, love for this to be interactive at the end, so um, here we go. Um, yesterday, oh, let's, let's go through. So we're, I'm going to make the case again a little bit. Uh, without repeating yesterday's talk about why we need a DPU. I'm going to go a bit more in depth about what a DPU is and how it works. And then we're going to cover in a little more detail how at Fungible we've implemented the DPU technology in terms of systems that help with composable infrastructure. Uh, we made the point yesterday that data is growing. This is one of the big drivers, obviously, for a need to change the way we think about data center architectures. Um, 101, 181 zettabytes in the next three years uh, is, is what the expectation is going to be. Um, that's a lot of data. We're, we've also seen some major shifts in uh, trends overall, we've seen Moore's Law start to slow down. Some people have say, it, say it's plateaued, um, but we've gone from a doubling of CPU uh, processing power every 18 months to every three years. Um, and if, if that in light of this exploding data, um, we're starting to see the need or an increasing need for acceleration at the hardware layer. Uh, again, the, the continued rise of, of containers, we're on pace in the next four or five years to see uh, installed containers uh, outpacing virtual machines. Um, virtual machines are still growing, certainly, but not at the same rate. And the, the reality is that as we move towards more and more uh, flexibility and agility in terms of how we manage and deploy applications, we really need the infrastructure to respond in the same way, with the same flexibility, the same agility. Uh, and we haven't really seen that in the market. Uh, and so Fungible was founded in 2015 with the idea of taking the economics or the utilization, the efficiency at the data center scale, and really driving an order of magnitude improvement in that. Uh, so that infrastructure can keep up with the rising demands of data and the applications that process that data. Um, we designed what we call the D data processing unit, or DPU, specifically for managing that data. And so this is an accelerator that's 100% that's targeted on data path operations, uh, or IO operations. Um, and, and really, I think what we're going to see is that the, the the DPU becomes a, a regular component in modern data center architectures. You know, a little look at history here. Uh, we've seen over the last 50 years really a convergence into a single purpose, general purpose processor, right? The CPU or x86. Uh, everything's converged into that. Uh, over the last two decades, we've really started to see the emergence of. Uh, purpose-built processors. GPUs are a great example, where the CPU is really great at handling a variety of tasks. It's built specifically for that. The GPU handles specific operations um, much, much better. And we've also seen the rise of FPGAs and other purpose-built accelerators, because the, the CPU, while it's great for many things, um, can be better in, in specific use cases, right? And so um, as this trend, again, starts to diverge into a variety of processors, uh, we believe that, that data is the key driver of all this growth. And so why not have an accelerator that's, that's targeted for that? We talk about data management. And, and at Fungible, we like to use the term data-centric computations. Um, 
Let's look at some trends. In, in 1987, the CPU was 20 times faster than the network. And so it made sense to put the I.O. drivers in the software on the x86. If we fast forward uh, to two years ago, the CPU now is 30 times slower than the network. Um, <laughs> I guess I jumped the gun. OK. Um, However, we're still seeing the I.O. drivers in x86 software. Um, you know, over this time, there's been a, a, an aggregate, a 600 times change in that ratio of network to CPU performance. Obviously, that creates a challenge um, for the x86 to be able to manage all this uh, effectively. There's a number of issues here. I'm not going to read everything on the slide for you. Um, but the, the net is that. In, in a lot of use cases, highly demanding use cases, uh, the x86 just can't keep up with the I.O. demands anymore. Um, and so for managing these data-centric workloads, um, we, need a, we need a better answer. Um, so it's worth explaining a little bit our definition of what is a data-centric workload, right? Work arrives as packets, and I'm reading from the bottom here. Um, there's a lot of multi multiplexing between multiple contexts in the workload. We see a medium to high ratio of I.O. to compute. Right? So this is definitely data that's, that's moving around. Um, and the computation is, is stateful. And that's sort of how we, we define data centric. Uh, and you look on the spectrum here, uh, the, the, the farther we get to the right on the chart, uh, the more data centric that workload is. Right? So at, at the network layer, Everything's packetized. There's lots of multiplexing. There's a ton of I.O. Um, and as you move to the left, uh, there tends to be less um, data management requirement. And so the idea of having a data processing unit to accelerate these data management functions um, is what we came up with. Uh, at scale, you think about a data a DPU as an endpoint in the network. However, different types of resources have very different data paths, right? The data path you might design to interact with a CPU or a server is going to be very different than one you do with storage, right? And so we built the chip to be flexible so that we can program different, uh, different data paths that are specific for these types of resources. Uh, obviously, each one of these buckets of resources is, is a huge market in and of itself. You know, we've seen uh, GPUs reach you know, a $10 billion market size. Uh, flash storage has been around a long time. Uh, that's a huge market. CPUs, obviously, are huge. Um, so each one of these um, ha is going to interact differently with the network and how it manages data. And so having these fronted by a DPU allows us to improve the efficiency. And, and we'll spend some time talking about how, how that happens. Um, so a fungible. Uh, we started with the DPU, and we've spent several years in R&D um, on the chip itself. We've actually got two chips. There's one that fits on the PCIe card, which you see on the left, uh, and that's used as, a, a, as an attachment into the host server. Uh, we've built a system uh, around scale-out block storage, which we call the fungible storage cluster, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And that uses the same architecture chip, but a larger chip, and that's an 800 gig chip. Um, and then most recently, about two months ago, we launched a solution called uh, Fungible GPU Connect. And what that allows is the pooling of GPUs into a chassis and then re remotely mounting those over Ethernet into the host. Um, so this is really kind of our whole technology stack that we have at Fungible. Again, based on the DPU <coughs> and the accelerators built in, into that chip, we have our operating system on top, which is where the data paths are programmed into. Uh, and you see some examples of those data paths uh, and then the systems. On the top, we've separated the control plane for all these systems so, that, so there's nothing, um, data path is independent, right? And the data path can scale in terms of infrastructure uh, and throughput independently of the control plane. So this is really built for the data center scale. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper into to some of these systems and how they work. We'll start with the fungible storage cluster. Um, this is a, a product which we're on our uh, fourth major software release now. Um, and what this is is a scale-out 
block storage, uh, all flash system. Right? In, in a single node, starting with a single node, um, we can see up, up to 13 million IOPS uh, out of a single node, and that's, that's read performance, um, very, very low latency, uh, and, and very good throughput. As that cluster grows, uh, that, that performance also increases linearly. Um, because we've implemented a lot of these uh, data path uh, accelerators in the, in the silicon, in the DPU, we're able to provide all the, the, all the enterprise storage features you'd expect from compression, encryption, erasure coding, clones, thin provisioning. Uh, but we can also do that on a per volume basis. So, so this is really designed uh, to run multiple workloads, you know, in a, in a cloud environment, that's important. You want to avoid the no noisy neighbor, so we've got quality of service. But something unique about the way we approach storage is each and every one of these volumes, uh, you can pick and choose which attributes you want to apply. So if you're running a database and you want it um, protected from two faults, you can do erasure coding for that. If you've got a different workload that, that you need to encrypt, you can encrypt that volume. And each and every volume, you can, you can tune these parameters individually. Um, here's a look at what, what the hardware looks like under the hood. And you see, on, you kind of divide it horizontally. Uh, we've got two DPUs in the box. That's the only processor in the box. And so we're actually directly terminating uh, IP. Uh, on the left, we've got uh, 600 gigabit ports per DPU in, in this chassis. Uh, and then each one of those DPUs controls 12 NVMe drives directly as well. And again, sorry, blinking. Um, again, this is really designed to be um, a multi-workload storage solution, right? And so whether you're running uh, instances off of bare metal to power your databases or, or whether those are SQL or NoSQL, um, those workloads can run directly next to virtualization workloads. Um, we have support uh, via Cinder driver uh, for OpenStack. Uh, we've got support for Kubernetes and a container storage interface. And, and all of this was designed to be API first. Uh, so every, every function and capability of the system is available through the API. We also have a, a GUI uh, to interact with the system as well. Let's look a little bit, let's talk a little bit more about erasure coding and some of the benefits that you can get from that. Uh, and, and obviously, we didn't invent erasure coding, but, but historically, erasure coding has come at a, a pretty high price in terms of the computation required. It's, it's complex math to figure out the erasure coding algorithm. We, we've built a, a, a specific accelerator for that erasure coding, and so we actually do erasure coding in the storage cluster on a node basis. So if you start, in this example, you start with six nodes in your cluster. Um, we can apply 4 comma 2 or 4 plus 2 erasure coding. That means you have four data blocks for every two parity blocks. What that does for you is it, it gives you a 50% overhead uh, to, to protect against two, two failures in, this, in the storage system. Um, if you compare that to a typical um, double replicated or RF2 volume, uh, the requirement there is 100% overhead. So, so we're saving data, making it, it overall on aggregate, you've got more usable data. Now, as your cluster grows, let's say you add four more nodes to this cluster, you've got 10 nodes in the cluster. Now we can apply 8 comma 2 erasure coding. Um, that further reduces the overhead uh, for durability. You're only now using 25% of that storage um, for replication. And then you grow the cluster again to 16 nodes. Uh, 14 comma 2 erasure coding, now we've shrunk that overhead to 14%. So you can see, as you start to scale out your storage cluster, effectively your cost per, per usable terabyte goes down. Um, just a quick note about our uh, involvement in the community. Um, we're a relatively new member, uh, which we're proud to be a, a, a silver member of the Op Op Open Infra Foundation. Um, we do have a Cinder driver. Uh, for this product, uh, we support the Victoria and the Xena um, distributions, and, and we're working to upstream our driver right now. Hopefully, we'll make the, the target for Zed. Um, we also have a CSI plugin, and, and of course, everything that I mentioned is, is also available through our RESTful API as well. Uh, one other option 
uh, when we deploy our fungible storage cluster um, is, is to use our DPU and a PCI card. We call this, uh, it's a hardware, uh, hardware storage initiator. Now this isn't a requirement for using our storage. Uh, any uh, modern Linux has an NVMe TCP driver already natively, um, but there are some advantages to using a DPU in the host as well. And the biggest advantage is that you're able, we're able to offload the NVMe TCP storage processing entirely off of the host. And then we present what looks like a local NVMe device uh, to that server. Um, there's a big advantage in terms of offloading those CPU cores. It allows that host to do the application workloads uh, it was designed to do. Another advantage in that we have DPUs now on both ends of that initiator uh, target connection is that we can apply additional capabilities to that connection. We can do encryption over the wire uh, as well as encryption uh, on the storage. We can compress that traffic. Uh, we can even uh, mount boot volumes and boot directly from uh, the storage cluster. Uh, and this really helps enable that bigger data center composability vision of a server really just needs to be a combination of CPU and memory and everything else in that it might need from a resource perspective can be composed into that server. In this example, the storage, even local disk, um, we're seeing performances that are equivalent to local NVMe, even though uh, it, it's accessed over Ethernet. And I, I, I gave this example yesterday as well, um, showing this, the, the capabilities of, of just the fungible storage cluster, but also the value of having the DPU in the host. Um, we, we participated with a couple of research institutions over the last year uh, in some testing. Uh, the first test was, was with NICAV, which is a research institution uh, here in Europe. They were able to, from a single host, get about 16 or six and a half million IOPS uh, attaching to uh, a, a single storage node, uh, fungible storage node. Um, San Diego Supercomputer repeated that test, um, but they added our, our hardware initiator, and they were able to get uh, 10 million IOPS. Um, but I think the, the most telling piece of this was the fact that they were able to reduce the CPU utilization by almost 75%. Right? In, in the NICEV example, while they were able to hit that um, pretty impressive benchmark of 6.5 million IOPS, um, the CPU was 100% used, right? So in a real world scenario, that's not very, uh, very useful for running application traffic if, if, if the whole computer is, is consumed with processing storage traffic. Um, in, in San Diego's use case, um, obviously you've got a lot of CPU left to do real work. Um, now this might be a little outside of the normal needs of you're not typically gonna see 10 million IOPS from a single box or need that kind of performance but I think it does illustrate the value of offloading a lot of this traffic into a DPU. All right, so let's talk about our next offering, which is the Fungible GPU Connect. Now we just launched this in April, um, and it, there's a number of reasons why you might wanna consolidate GPUs into a pool and be able to attach those to, to hosts um, only when you need them. Um, one, GPUs are an expensive resource. Uh, two, they tend to be fairly underutilized uh, in, a, in a data center environment. You might need it for machine learning training, um, but when that training job is done, those are gonna sit idle, right? And so uh, the opportunity to drive better utilization of that, that GPU means you're saving money. Um, a, a, another reason is that if you look at a machine learning workflow, for example, you may need a very different CPU to GPU ratio during training than you would during inference. And so the ability to attach the right kind of GPU to the right host system during training, detach those, and then attach maybe a different GPU for inference can add a lot of value. And this particularly is valuable in environments that aren't just running one ML workload, but maybe they've, they've gone through their proof of concept everybody's bought into machine learning, and all of a sudden there's 10 different business units all doing machine learning at the same time. Um, th managing the infrastructure for that uh, can be pretty daunting, uh, not, to, not to mention expensive. Um, so this is what the, the solution looks like from Fungible. We have a chassis on the right, 
which we call the FX108. It's basically uh, a, a bunch of PCI slots uh, in, in a 4U box, uh, and, and that box comes with our DPUs, and then you know, the user of this would install their own GPU cards. Um, we connect uh, upstream to standard 100 gig gigabit Ethernet switches, so no configuration required, nothing special at the switching layer. Um, and then in the host server, we install uh, a, a DPU in the form of our uh, PCI card, which we call the FC200. That's a 200 gig card. Um, and then we've got our, our composer, our control plane, uh, that, that we can run in a VM. There we go. So let's, let's give a, a, a little example of what this might look like in, a, in, a, in an environment. Uh, we've got several servers on the left here. Uh, each have different requirements for GPUs. And then we've got a, a GPU chassis uh, that's populated with eight GPUs. So we start the first AI ML workload, and it needs four GPUs. So we can attach those to the hosts. Uh, the, the workload runs. Um, now we've got a virtualization workload that also requires GPUs. It needs two GPUs. Let's attach those to that host. Um, now our, our first uh, machine learning workload no longer needs four GPUs. It only needs three. Maybe it's shifted from, from training to inference. And so it detaches one of those GPUs. It becomes available in the pool. And now our second machine learning workload spins up. It's got three GPUs available. Um, so you start to see how, over time, you can drive utilization of those eight GPUs across multiple workloads, even as the demands change. Um, so just a couple of quick pictures uh, of, of our user interface for this. It's a pretty simple um, workflow. We've got um, a view of the hosts. We've got a view of the GPUs that are available, and we catalog those by type of GPU, what it's attached to, uh, all the basic metrics you'd expect. And then it's, it's simply attach and detach um, from the available hosts. So in this screen, you can see uh, a, a selection box for which GPUs you want to attach. Um, sorry, the clicker doesn't work very well. And here's a view of, of within the, the GPU chassis uh, where it's populated, which cards. So this can help from an operational pr perspective if you want to go add a new GPU card or see what's available, what's in inventory. This is an available product today. Um, we're particularly interested in the service provider community because we think that there's a big opportunity to add GPUs into the hosts from a, either a bare metal or a virtualization perspective. We're seeing a, a, a big increase in workloads that leverage GPUs. Um, and so um, we're excited about this, this offering. Um, we do have, uh, I'll probably repeat a little bit from yesterday, but, but just some numbers around um, what we've seen in testing. Uh, you know, the idea of remotely attaching GPUs, I think, has been tested in the past. And a, a typical question we get is, well, what about performance? How do you handle this over Ethernet? Um, obviously, PCIe uh, is pretty latency sensitive. And so we ran uh, benchmarks as we were developing this, pr this product. Um, and, and we used a variety of benchmarks from the machine learning world, uh, in this case, ResNet. Um, and, and this is an example where we compare um, the performance of a server with a, a GPU directly installed in it to one using our solution. Um, and across a number of batch sizes in ResNet, uh, we see essentially equivalent performance, whether it's directly attached or attached over Ethernet. Um, a second test, second algorithm, this time with two GPUs. Again, we're seeing, you can start to see in the bar graphs a little bit of, of difference in performance, but it's, it's really 1% to 2%. Um, you could argue that's within the margin of error, but, but certainly there's, there's a little bit of expense in, in traversing uh, Ethernet, but 1% or 2% trade-off in, per, in performance versus the ability to drive utilization uh, can have a lot of value. And really to wrap up, you know, I think that uh, data and, and the applications that are driving the growth of data and consuming that data more and more in a real-time sense um, are, are driving the demands of infrastructure. 
infrastructure clearly needs to respond. Um, uh, DPUs are going to be a, a, a major part of, of modern servers and data center infrastructure, uh, particularly at scale. Um, and leveraging systems that, that embed DPUs makes this technology a lot easier to consume. You know, our approach at Fungible is to make sure everything uh, is accessible over Ethernet. We believe you know, a converged Ethernet network is where, where the industry is going. Uh, and, and hopefully that'll make uh, these technologies easier to consume. And I think that are, is the end of my slides. So um, we've got about five minutes left for, for q and I'm told we can go a couple minutes over if we need to, but um, if people have questions, I'm happy to, to answer. We do have microphones um, so everyone can hear you. Don't see a lot of questions. Here's, here's one. Thank you. Getting us started. Okay, maybe one question. Are you doing maybe a GPU over Ethernet? I haven't heard about this. Just curious. I'm sorry, what kind of Ethernet? GPU over Ethernet. Because storage is common, right? But GPU, I haven't heard. Maybe you are doing it. I don't know. I'm, GPU? I, GPU? Aren't you, do you have some solutions for sharing GPUs over Ethernet? Oh, sharing the DPU over Ethernet? No, GPU, right? Graphical processing unit. The GPU. Yes. Yeah, we are sharing the GPU over Ethernet. Um, what we've done essentially is virtualize the PCIe switch. Okay. Um, and then moving that over Ethernet. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks. And so th from the host perspective, it sees a local uh, PCIe switch and a locally attached GPU. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you speak of uh, GPU, um, are, are, you, uh, uh, are you only working with uh, NVIDIA? So you were speaking of uh, A10 uh, Ampere. So is it only NVIDIA or are you supporting over GPUs? Great question. Um, so today in the product, in our first release, we've qualified the, the Ampere line of NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so from A2 to A100, um, we, can, we can support really any PCIe device in the box, uh, but we don't want to claim that that's fully tested yet. Um, so we are testing additional vendors of GPUs and additional generations of NVIDIA GPUs as well. Um, and our expectation is that that, that um, qualified matrix is going to grow over time. And so, so it's a qualified, it's supported uh, by NVIDIA, or because they have a list of uh, certified hardware, is it, uh, is, it, is it certified by NVIDIA or, or not yet? Is it certified by NVIDIA? Um, no, not yet. <laughs> um, so actually the chassis, we don't manufacture the chassis for that GPU, so uh, it ships with the chassis supports NVIDIA, and there is a certification for at the hardware layer. Um, and so I guess in, the, in that answer, it, uh, the NVIDIA GPUs are certified by NVIDIA um, to work with that hardware platform. But we are working through that certification process as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, mix support for uh, GPUs that, are, that you are passing? Because basically, you also might want to leverage that. And then you also have like somehow license these GPUs. Yeah. Is there any solution for that? So, if I heard you right, it was you were asking about MIG support. Yes. Yes. So, in the product, we haven't um, certified MIG support yet. We have tested it, and it does work. Um, but but again, there's additional work to to make sure we're certified for use in that. Now, in in this solution, it's worth noting that we don't provide the GPUs. Um, we can as an option, but typically um, most customers will have their own GPUs that they want to use. Um, and so the, the, the licensing for the GPU, um, the, the customers... About probably you provide uh, scheduling of uh, GPUs as you've shown. So if you like use uh, MIG, then you can't revoke uh, GPU kind of, I guess. So this should be controlled on software or something like that, right? Yeah. And you do this. Yeah, so right now um, in, in our user interface, um, the, the, the unit of GPU is a single GPU. Okay. Right, and so the, the idea of either a fractional GPU or the, the other version of that question is NVLink, can we support GPUs that are, that are connected directly? Um, we have tested that in the labs, but there's additional work to make sure that, that 
you know, all the edge cases are tested and things like and that. Other question, uh, you showed the user interface. Is there any CLI or API or something you can use for automation, basically? We, d we do have an API. Again, everything in the UI is available in the API for this product. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good questions. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks for your time. We're, we're right at time now, so um, thanks for keeping me on time. I appreciate you coming, and, and please enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference. Thank you.